We've organized our meeting this year a little bit differently to better focus on some key topics while not forcing everyone to spend an entire day staring at their screens. So on the first day today, we'll be having short presentations on sudden oak death, Bay Area tree decline, and a review of other plant health concerns, followed by a brief Q&A period. We plan to wrap up in about an hour and a half or by 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Day two, which is tomorrow, Wednesday the 22nd, we're focusing on of the U.S. Forest Service Pacific Northwest Region in Portland, Oregon, and Sarah is going to be giving us an overview of the P. Ramorum NE2 lineage in Oregon. And now, Sarah, you should be able to. Great. Thank you, Janice, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm asked, and I'll start my video just for this first slide, and then I'll turn it off to save bandwidth and then turn it back on for questions. Um, but I'm actually in California today, uh, so I'm closer to you guys than usually in Oregon. So thank you for inviting me to give a update on sudden oak death in Oregon forests, um, focused on the NA2 variant um, and where we are in Oregon. So I just wanted to start off with a kind of just very brief overview of um, our sudden oak death program in Oregon. Let me see if I can advance my slide. Sorry about that. Hold on, I'm gonna have to end my show and start it up again really fast. There seems to be some issues. I'll stop the share. Okay, I'm going to have to um, exit out of my PowerPoint presentation for some reason. I've never had this issue before, but. It's the day to have those issues, Sarah. So welcome it to the club. Totally is. And as I was telling Janice, I do have a shorter presentation, so I kind of built in some time. Oh. So our sudden oak death program in Oregon consists of five components. Um, we have year round survey and detection for new infestations outside of our generally infested area here in Oregon. And these are done by staff at the Oregon Department of Forestry, US Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management and consists of ground surveys in high risk, high priority areas um, stream baiting from April to around December of every year. We're baiting 58 streams in Curry County, Oregon this year. And then we also are fly, and then we also fly aerial surveys throughout the year. Um, due to COVID, we have, we've had to reduce the number of aerial surveys that we've been flying over the last two years. Um, but we were able to get one helicopter survey in earlier this year, and we will be flying a fixed wing survey um, actually next week here in Oregon. And then we also have been relying more heavily on high resolution aerial imaging and using structured classification um, to help us pinpoint new, potentially new infestations of sudden oak death outside of our quarantine area. Uh, once we find a new infected site, we delimit the amount of infected trees in the area, and then we set a treatment buffer based on those ground, highly intensive ground surveys, and then we treat the infected site, and this includes cutting, piling, and burning both infected tan oaks as well as healthy tan oaks within a certain buffer size. This can range from 500 to 600 feet. 
um, around a single infected tree, depending on the amount of funding available, as well as the priority of the site based on the location and the quarantine uh, lineage, as well as um, agency, um, agent, agency priorities as well. And then uh, the last two are regulation and education. And this is done mainly with the Oregon Department of Agriculture as the regulatory authority in the state of Oregon with the quarantine and education through OSU Extension and Norma Klein's program um, for Curry and Coos County Forestry. And then lastly, monitoring and research uh, which we rely on the lab of Dr. Jared Laboldis at Oregon State University um, to do continued research and monitor and helping with monitoring of sudden oak death infestations as well. Um, as I mentioned, that high resolution imaging here in Oregon, we've been obtaining it since 2021, mainly to track. Uh, the main purpose back then was to track disease progression within the generally infested area just right outside of the uh, town of Brookings. And so you can see uh, these tan oak stands and uh, light brown infected trees within each of these stands. Uh, fast forward four years, we have extensive mortality within the stands and then um, to 2021. So this picture was taken in July of this year and you can see those same tan oak stands. In some cases, there's no tan oak standing whatsoever. And so using that imaging to track the disease process and um, report out disease progression in Oregon. And so some quick updates for everyone today. Um, we do have a new staffing update for our Oregon SOD program. Uh, the Oregon Department of Forestry has filled their forest pathologist position. Uh, this has been filled by Gabriella Ritakova. She comes to ODF from OSU, where she was the assistant director of the Swift Needlecast Research Cooperative for the last nine years. Um, and before that, she did her master's with Tom Gordon at UC Davis. Um, so we're all really happy to have Gabby as a part of the SOD program. And we're going to be working over the next uh, few months to get her up to speed with everything that is going on. Um, we will be flying a aerial survey, as I mentioned, next week for said note death in Oregon. Um, and we are using the high resolution imaging that was obtained in July of this year to do more intensive tracking within the generally infested area, as well as um, looking at any outliers outside of our quarantine area, because the imaging does extend from our Port Orford NA2 infestation all the way down throughout the quarantine area. Um, ODF has some good budget news for this year for sudden oak death. They were provided with 1.7 million in the state general budget for fiscal years 2021 through 2023 for sudden oak death treatments. Um, and so that 1.7 million will be going mostly to treatments there with $50,000 of it going to the Association of Oregon Counties to continue to facilitate the Sudden Oak Death Task Force in Oregon. Um, and we have had two detections of Sudden Oak Death outside of our state quarantine area in 2021. Um, the first was, you'll see it's along the Rogue River in that purple emergency quarantine boundary. And that was detected in March of this year using actually um, NAEP aerial imaging from um, that was acquired uh, late last year. And uh, so we were able to get on the ground sample and those trees have already been cut and piled as of May. So within two months, uh, we were able to get those trees on the ground and we're just waiting for more rains to come to get them to, um, to burn. This was, this was located on Forest Service ground, and so we were granted emergency NEPA from the district forester in Gold Beach to complete this treatment. Um, and so that's what we were able to get it done in just two month time span. And we've been doing uh, more intensive surveys in the area, and we do have a tentative positive um, near there currently. And so we're working, but it was um, PCR positive only, so we're working on getting a culture 
there. Um, and then the second new infestation that we have is right outside of the town of Port Orford. So it is 21 miles north of any known infestation. Um, and this is the one that I wanted to update everyone on today. And so this, the Port Orford find uh, was, trees were sampled by Eva Peterson, an OSU researcher on, on April 27th of this year, as she was traveling um, north along Highway 101 um, from Brookings back to Corvallis. She noticed red and dying tan oaks along the highway and stopped and took a sample of uh, two trees. The OSU lab confirmed them as positive for Phytophthora morum on May 10th, and ODA established a, has since established a three-mile quarantine around those infected trees. Um, and this was alarming to us in the beginning, or when uh, Eva confirmed them as positive, because it represents a 21 mile jump from any known positive of Phytophthora remorum in Oregon forest and only 13 miles from the curry Coos boundary in Oregon, which um, one of the main drivers of slowing the spread of sudden oak death in Oregon is to prevent the potential or de and delay the potential spread of sudden oak death into Coos County because of the economic impacts of that um, that could happen to the port of Coos Bay and the timber export markets. And so here's the uh, three mile quarantines that were established around both of those, those new finds outside of the um, sod quarantine in Oregon. And so here's the uh, two trees that Eva spotted along the highway. Um, we were very fortunate that she spotted them and stopped and sampled uh, just eagle eye because definitely she, I mean, the speed limit's 55 here. So that was a great, great find. And we're all very appreciative um, that she took the time and sampled those trees. And we, at the time when we got the results, um, we were hoping that this was, that these trees were the introduction and that we had caught it really early and it was just, we were going to be able to go in, hit these two trees and the surrounding uh, 600 foot buffer pretty hard um, and be done. But unfortunately, after more intensive ground surveys in the area, starting with these larger parcels, uh, we have detected more infected trees in the area. Uh, so far, they've come up um, as the NA2 variant, and this was confirmed by Nick Grunwald's lab at Oregon State University, uh, USDA ARS. And um, so this, to us, points to a new introduction in our Oregon forest. And we have, so since then, we've increased ground and stream and aerial surveys. So we were able to fly a helicopter survey over this area in uh, mid-June of this year. We've also installed four stream baits in this area. Um, and we have at this point over 150 positive samples. Uh, we have begun treatment within this area, as you can see uh, in those kind of teal blue blocks. It's about 50 acres that ODF has done herbicide hack and squirt treatment on the tan oaks within those blocks and cutting of those tan oaks started just last week. Um, ODF is working with the private landowners within this area to obtain permissions on the other parcels uh, to begin treatment on other areas. Uh, with the treatment buffer set as it is, um, it's a little over 500 acres, and so it will uh, most likely use up that 1.7 million that ODF was granted in the state budget. Uh, so far, we've had uh, very good cooperation from private landowners in the area. People have been seeing the increased presence in ODF and Forest Service vehicles, and they've been stopping and chatting um, and just asking folks what's going on. Um, so that's been really good and positive. We enjoy those positive experiences with landowners. And um, so ODA has also um, been involved heavily sending these samples to the National USA APHIS Lab for final confirmation because it is a new location. 
um, as well as beginning the process of scoping potential for a quarantine boundary expansion. Um, and OSU Extension um, held their first landowner workshop last week, and we'll be holding a second workshop tomorrow for local landowners. Um, and here's a shot from our new high resolution imaging from this year. And so you can see that uh, sudden oak death has, has been in this area for quite some time. Um, being on the ground with Alan Kanaski and Jared Leboldis, the three of us um, really got the feeling that this has probably been here for about four to five years undetected. Um, and really that, that uh, find from EBA was the way that we were able to do it because it was finally visible from the highway. Um, so with that, uh, we are continuing treatment in this area, working with the landowners, and we're also uh, looking at the potential for getting an air curtain incinerator unit to stage within the treatment area to consume the material from those really small parcels where we're not going to be able to safely pile burn. Um, and then hoping to provide a biochar product to landowners within that infected treatment area um, to put back on their land afterwards as a fertilizer. So with that, I'll stop share and take any questions. Also, I'll provide a link uh, to the new Oregon Sod dashboard in the chat for anyone that wants to uh, kind of keep up with the numbers here in Oregon. Thank you, Sarah. We do have five minutes for questions. If anyone has anything for Sarah, feel free to type it into the chat now. And Sarah, I'm going to let you see this first question from Susan. Where do you think the infestation started? And Sarah, you are not sharing any audio if you're talking right now. Oh, oops, sorry. Um, so in being on the ground, I get I get the sense that the infestation probably started in and around the transfer station or the dump right outside of town. And so this shot that I have here, um, this building right up at the top is the transfer station for the city of Port Orford. Um, and so this is where we have the most heavily infected tan oak stand in the area. And it's kind of right in the middle of where we have most of our infected trees. Sarah, um, do you want to take one of these other questions? Um, Chris had asked, where does the range of tan oak end relative to Port Orford? Yeah, so the range of tan oak does extend into Coos County about, I want to say midway into the county. Um, and so it does extend probably 20, 30 miles north of Port Orford, but it does tend to peter out. And in these stands in Port Orford, we see a different mix than we typically see further south. So these stands are, it's tan oak mixed with a heavy component of rhododendron as well as shore pine. Great, and maybe one more question. Michelle had asked what the imagery that you're using. Um, if she said that in the beginning, she missed that. Yeah, um, the imagery we use is uh, ODF contract with a vendor here in Oregon called Eagle Digital Imagery. And they, um, provide, they do um, aerial photography for ODF on a yearly basis. And I see Susan's question, and right now on the on the ground, um, it's really hard to kind of see any distinct difference in disease behavior for the NA2 lineage. Um, but one thing that we are noting in our uh, samples and our survey data sheets is we're not seeing any bleeds on these cankers, or if we do see bleeds. Uh, once you hack back behind the bark, we're seeing armillaria, um, and we're not we're not really seeing so we're not really seeing that traditional bleeding canker um, on these trees that we're sampling. We're doing a lot of what we call dry hacking into trees. 
Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. That's just about right on time. If you would uh, stop sharing right now and I'm going to transition. Um, Mateo had actually asked a question, but I'm going to let him just fill that into the time he has. Um, our next speaker is Mateo Garbalato of UC Berkeley, and he's going to be giving us an overview of um, Bay Area tree decline. Um, and there you see his title slide. Mateo, you should be ready to take it away. Okay, well, I have a pretty big topic to discuss because this is brand new information for science. So <laughs> I guess we we'll can talk about those topics later on in the discussion. So uh, I'm presenting today some still preliminary results that were the outcome of pretty intensive research that was uh, asked of my lab in the, last, uh, in the last six months. And so they are to be taken with a grain of salt, but nonetheless, they're important. And the reason for the research was, uh, and the connection to this meeting is that there was a very abrupt sudden mortality of several tree species um, all around the Bay Area. And of course, one thing that was being circulated, oh, there is a new sudden of death that's affecting these trees. And so we actually wanted to figure out what, what was going on. And so the, the aim of this job um, that we, we partially concluded right now was to understanding the drivers of this larger scale dieback that's affecting both exotic and native species in Northern California. And we, we focus on the exotic tree species because that's where the dieback was more significant and also was closer to urban areas. But the same is happening for other um, native species such as California bay laurel, manzanitas and blue oaks. And so we wanted to figure out besides the dieback, what are the general symptoms and signs that we are observing on these trees? So are we observing cankers? Are we observing seeping? Are we observing wood staining, fungal structures? Um, are there fungi, assuming that this is a fungal issue, that um, were consistently found in every single location, suggesting maybe that they could play a primary role in the observed dieback? And there, there are other fungi that are consistently isolated from dying trees or, or declining trees, um, that maybe are not ubiquitous as the other ones, but um, they may, may be site specific, but they be still playing a role. And then also very importantly, because it was one of the triggers for the research, are the fungi involved, if any, native or exotic? So uh, I will present the two studies. Uh, we completed one and we are about three quarters on, on, on the way with, with the other one. Uh, the first one was on acacia, and we, we actually sampled quite intensively four sites, eight trees from each site, and then eucalyptus, um, mostly blue gum, in six sites of, around the Bay Area. As you can see, this, these sites are pretty far apart, uh, and they're both on the San Francisco Peninsula and the East Bay. And the approach here was to intensively sample individual trees. Uh, between four and eight trees per site, depending on the species, and to um, uh, sample any symptomatic plant tissue that we could find. So symptoms was very important in driving what we were actually culturing. And we were culturing everything on five different growth media, and we were also bathing the soil from uh, under each tree. And bathing is done to find out whether we, we may have any soil-borne pathogens, and in particular Phytophthoras. This is what uh, this mortality looks like um, around the Bay Area. I should also point out that this is really a dieback. It doesn't really mean mortality. Some of these trees are coming back and this is actually one of the unanswered questions because we did a research really rapidly. These are acacias, blackwood acacias that are, are dying, well, are declining um, in large numbers in, in the East Bay. Um, and when we went into these different sites around the Bay Area, it was pretty clear that in every site we could find uh, symptoms like this. So we could see cankers that were visible from the outside. I'm, I'm hoping that you can see these cankers, these fissures in, in the bark sometimes with some reaction wood. Um, these were fairly consistent. When we went and studied eucalyptus instead, we really didn't have anything like that. The only consistent symptoms, so these are two different stands in two different locations. It's hard to see in the picture, but if you look on the, on the left-hand side, you can see that the canopy is actually brown. So most of these trees had canopy that was partially or in, in a very high percentage of the canopy was brown. And the only consistent symptom that we found on these trees was not cankers, 
was not lesions, but really it was the browning of the leaves. So leaf blight was the only symptom that was consistent and ubiquitous across uh, all the different um, six uh, sampling sites that we, we studied in the, um, in, um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so these are the results. So we, we, we collected um, quite a large number of samples. Remember that each sample is processed six times. So, well, five times plus one for each tree. So we had 81 samples for acacias and 124. So multiply that by five. Again, the symptoms were very different. So we, we definitely had cankers and acacias. We only had leaf browning that was consistent in every site. Uh, we did have other site, other symptoms that were site specific. And I don't have time to go through them, but we had all the different types of symptoms that you expect in a declining trees, we found them, but they were not widespread, they were site specific. And we did find a very large number of fungi that have a reputation for being pathogens of some sort. However, in the acacias, the only two that were found in every single site were Diaporthi funiculina and Dothiorella viticola. Um, and usually we found either one or the other, but the sampling was not very intensive. So that is not definitive. In the case of eucalyptus, the only ubiquitous fungi that we found were leaf fungi, mostly a fungus called Pseudocidova eucalypti and another one called Clodosporium. Um, at, each at each site, we found symptom and infection by other latent pathogens. Um, but in, in every case, except for one, these other latent pathogens, so I'm not talking about diaporthy and dothiorella. They were only found in trees that were already infected by diaporthy or dothiorella, with one exception, a zygomycete called Umbelopsis ramaniana. This was the only exception. The trees were declining, and the only fungus that we found consistently was Umbelopsis ramaniana in one site. Um, for eucalyptus, we found a variety of latent pathogens. Um, and we also found attacks by pathogens that normally are associated with trees that are declining very severely, so at the end of their life. Any sign of alien pathogen? In acacia, not really. We only found one pathogen. It's a pathogen of acacia, only reported from Australia. And it's known to be a latent pathogen with an endophytic stage. It means that it lives inside the plant, but it doesn't cause disease. So it's likely to be moved around where acacias are moved. Um, and with green in greenhouse inoculations, we have shown it is a little bit more aggressive than the native species, um, but we, we didn't, we couldn't really inoculate it in adult trees uh, because of complications. And so we don't really know uh, if it is a, an aggressive pathogen or not. It was only found in one site, but that site is the worst hit. In the case of eucalyptus, we found two um, uh, exotic pathogens, but these, even if they're exotic in quotation mark, Everybody knows that they are kind of present everywhere eucalyptus is grown. So they're not officially reported in California, but people have been talking about them. So basically in both cases, um, these alien introduced fungi, probably they've been introduced a long time ago and they're not likely to be major players of the mortality that has been observed. So we can scratch that option off. So here we are. These are some of the results. These are DNA sequences actually aligned. And these are Dothiorella viticola and the Aporthifin kilina are really the, the only ones that were found in every site, suggesting that these may be playing a primary role in the acacia decline. Um, and so we came up with this hypothesis. So Dothiorella monete, Dothiorella viticola, either or, let's think of them as the same really, and the Aporthifin kilina, uh, potentially they, uh, they could be primary pathogens. Two important things. These um, Dothiorella viticola and Funiculina Diaporta for Eucalina have already been reported in California, but they have a broad host range and they're known to cause a pretty serious degree of disease um, in a multitude of hosts. So there is a little red flag going up here because these are infectious and potentially virulent pathogens. Um, they're also known to be latent pathogens, which means they start as endophytes, um, then they become pathogens, and then they actually do really well on the wood after they kill the tree and they actually sporulate on the wood. So their biology is fairly complex. Um, all the other fungi on um, the acacias were only isolated on trees that were already infected by either Diaporthi funiculina or Dothiorella viticola. And these two fungi were always associated with the very uh, characteristic wood staining and cankers. Um, 
the only exception to the rule was Umbelopsis uh, ramaniana. And so um, we actually started thinking that maybe Umbelopsis may also be playing a role, but it would only be playing a role in a single site where it was isolated. And so we performed Cox postulate, which means we actually inoculated healthy plants with these pathogens. And actually our hypothesis was confirmed correct. Um, I'm gonna look at the square on, on the right because it's easier. This is actually based on adult trees. And the size of the bar indicates, oh, I'm sorry about that. The size of the bar indicates how large the lesion was in just about three months. And so diaporthy, which is the second one, it's, it's a really aggressive pathogen. Umbelopsis, which is now known to be a pathogen, was also relatively aggressive. And then Dothiorella was also aggressive, uh, an aggressive pathogen, although significantly less than, uh, than diaporthy. So we were able to conclude that these two pathogens actually really are driving the mortality of acacias. And the big concern here is that they sporulate on that matter and that they have a, host, uh, a wide host range. On the left here, the only thing I want you to see is the two left columns. This is the, the effect of diaporthy. On the left is with regular rainfall and on the right is in drought situation. So we have another problem here that these pathogens are really um, enhanced or their activity is enhanced uh, or hastened by the lack of water or by drought situation. So here we have a compounding problem. Um, on eucalyptus, remember the only symptom that was ubiquitous was leaf blight. And in fact, the two fungi causing leaf blight were found pretty much in every single site we sampled. Both of these are known to be endophytes as well. So really the most parsimonious explanation of their presence is that these fungi have come along uh, from wherever eucalyptus, these eucalyptus came from, have come along. And now because of uh, climatic conditions, their uh, pathogenic activity has been triggered. So these are, uh, this is a, a, common, a commonality between the results of the two species. We did find secondary pathogens. All of these are known as latent pathogens. So they're all known uh, to be associated with trees in environmental stress um, and subject to defoliation. So the picture is perfect. So these are Cytospora, Neophysicoccum eucalyptorum, um, and Graphostroma bisconioxia. okay? Uh, these were only, they were not present in every single site, but some of them like Cytospora and Neophysicoccum were present in three sites. Nonetheless, these really, they were very marginal in terms of symptoms that they were causing on a tree. It could have been a single branch that had symptoms. And that's where we sampled because we were looking for symptomatic tissue. So um, let's clarify what I'm talking about. So a primary pathogen is an aggressive microorganism capable of causing disease in a healthy tree, like Phytophthora romorum, the agent of sudden of death. We didn't really find any primary pathogen. A secondary or opportunistic pathogen is one that can only cause disease in a tree that's already infected by another pathogen. And we had plenty of examples of this um, in our case, but usually, um, you know, for instance, we, the trees that were already infected by diaporthy, and, we, and we, had, we had other pathogens that I didn't have time to talk about. So they're not really the topic of this short presentation. When I talk about latent pathogens, I talk about these endophytes. So they can live within a tree for decades. And normally we know now they're triggered by altered physiological condition in the plant. Um, and definitely climate change can trigger that. So we know the water shortage can trigger their, uh, their activity as pathogens. And then they can do very well on, on the dead trees, the trees that they killed and they sporulate abundantly. And when it rains, we will infect new trees. So let's put the piece together of the story for acacias. Acacias are not native to California and probably they're not very well adapted to the sites where they're being planted. We have two fungi, Diaporthy, Funiculina, and Othrella viticola. They're generalists and they're non endophytes that can turn pathogenic and cause aggressive disease. And that's exactly what we think is happening. Because of their already inside the tree, they can cause disease in a very, very short time. Um, probably, uh, both fungi had a long period of time when they were able to jump onto acacias from other hosts. So they've been reported on multiple hosts in California and around the world. So they had plenty of time. However, we also think that the high rainfall of 2017, which was the wettest 
year, the wettest, the wettest year in, in California history, probably led to a very significant colonization by these endophytic fungi. And then the drought triggered their activity as pathogens. Plus the high density of acacias, these acacias grow in very high stands because they naturally regenerate, facilitated also infection of tree to tree. And it, the, the drought they were experiencing triggered them to become pathogens. And then of course, the secondary fungi jump on these trees. The weather itself do not, does not explain the mortality. So the weather triggers the fungi and the fungi are responsible for the mortality. So this is very important to keep in mind. For eucalyptus, the story is very different. Even if them like acacias are not native to California, none of the fungi isolated from eucalyptus are primary aggressive pathogens. We found two um, exotic organisms, but we, we already knew they were in eucalyptus. They're just not officialized in California. And also they're very specific to eucalyptus. So there is no risk, at least no known risk that they're gonna jump on different hosts. And so we think that really in the case of eucalyptus, we're looking at the dieback that's caused by host specific fungi that are being driven by climate. So it's a little bit of a different situation, even if in both cases, we can talk about latent pathogens. So latent pathogens are Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde pathogens. Reversal from Hyde to Jekyll may not be possible. Keep this in mind. Because they're already in the host, disease can be very rapid. And climate change by itself may not be enough to kill the host yet. So these really are now the key players, not just in these two plant species, but on any every plant species that we've studied recently. Originally, we thought of these as rare occurrences, only with climate conditions were extreme, but now because climate change is generalized, these are having a generalized effect. And so my observation is that right now, because of climate change, latent pathogens would be major drivers of plant mortality. And probably they're gonna reshape the composition and structure of our terrestrial ecosystems in California. And so this is a little schematic representation. If we start from the little spores in the second square, those are the spores that are generated by these, uh, these uh, latent pathogens. Uh, they infect the tree when, it, when, when, there's a, when it's rain. When there is drought, they switch from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde and they cause these lesions. You can see the lesions in a cross section. You can see the lesions in the longitudinal section. The, um, this fungi can cause a dieback on the tree and they can weaken the tree and then the tree can be infected by, second, infected by secondary organisms. And this can lead to large scale rapid tree mortality. And of course, this is probably more common with planted exotic trees because they're the ones that are less adapted to our climate. Is this a permanent situation? We don't know. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we're probably, right now, we're probably where the second yellow curve is, the, the, the peak of the curve. So we have three potential outcomes. The blue dotted line would be an outcome where everything goes back to normal. The red line is one where things don't go back to normal. So we lose a large number of the individuals of these three, three species. And the third option, which I think is the most likely one, is that we are gonna have boost and boom, uh, boost and boom cycles with populations of the pathogens going up and down. And that's inversely proportional to the survival of the tree. So eventually we're gonna to get to these trees being eliminated from our landscape, but it may take quite a few cycles. Because we don't know where we are, we don't know which one of the three trajectories we'll see, it's very difficult to make recommendations. So it's very difficult to formulate BMPs. So these are just some pointers. I have two slides. One is these recommendations are not all or nothing recommendation, just do something do something in the direction of recommendation can be beneficial. And more importantly, because climate is driving these diseases, anything that can make the trees happy is gonna be beneficial. And also at the same time, if we want to preserve this particular tree species, species sanitation may be important. So eliminating the, 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 the inoculum, which is the spores produced by the fungus may be beneficial. So, BMPs that I could come up looking at what, what's published, which is very little from different systems. Eucalyptus and acacias should be eliminated from drier sites. So this is a clear telltale sign that these species don't belong to really dry site. So we should just say, hey, these are exotic species, let go, let's get rid of them where they don't belong. If we have sites where these species have to be maintained, we need to reduce the density. So there's too many trees in the site. So we need to reduce the density. And if these trees are important to us for whatever reason, uh, we may have to somehow reduce the number of spores. 
by removing the dead wood, burning it, composting it, or mix it with the soil to avoid inoculum buildup. And each one of each one of them has a cost and also has a side effect. So uh, we should be careful. We may need to be, if these trees are so important, we, need, we may need to water the stands, making sure that the water doesn't touch the canopy because the canopy, especially in eucalyptus, will intensify the, um, the foliar blight that we, um, that we see. And of course, especially in eucalyptus prune trees, but also in acacias, pruning trees reduces the demand for water and also takes out the spores, the inoculum that are produced on the live trees. If you have a, a single tree that's important, prune the dead wood, eliminate the green waste from under the tree and water, but again, without touching the canopy. And so I also like to point out that there are differences between these two trees that were studied. Um, the fungi associated with acacia dieback are generalists known to cause disease on a large range of plants, including natives. So we are a little bit concerned about, about these fungi that are growing in acacias. They sporulate, sporulate on dead woody debris. So reduction of woody debris is recommended. And what should we reduce? Mostly these fungi are present in branches and stems. So including the root color. So focus on woody debris is important. Okay, so this is acacia. Let's move on to eucalyptus on the other side. Although we found no native fungi associated with the dieback in eucalyptus, they're not known to be aggressive pathogens in the literature, and they're normally associated with climatic change, and they are eucalyptus specific. So immediately you see that the issue is completely different. Um, and although sanitation, so inoculum reduction is always good, in this case, maybe it's not necessary. It's not necessarily a priority. However, if we need to eliminate inoculum, maybe because we want to preserve um, some eucalyptus in the site, Let's remember the most infectious are in the leaves and the twigs. So really what we need to eliminate here is the leaves and the twigs. And we can dispose of the larger wood in a very different way, okay? So we need to differentiate. So basically we have a different situation in, uh, uh, in acacia and eucalyptus uh, in many different respects. I wanted to acknowledge people in my lab, uh, especially Tina Popenak, Dash Schmidt, and Ines Marquez. They did 99% uh, of the work. And then as I was writing this, I didn't even remember all the names of the people that helped us, but the SFPUC, the city of Albany and the East Bay, East Bay Regional Parks were instrumental in providing funds and also in providing labor that helped us during the research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matteo. Um, we used up all of that time, but we were gonna have time at the end for questions as well. So I'm going to save the three questions and comments that came in from Simon, Dan, and Yana for the end. Um, and I'm sure we will have time to get to them. Right now, I'm going to introduce our next speaker who is Chris Lee with, the, with CAL FIRE. He's also the chair of the California Mortality Task Force and he's going to be giving us an update on other California oak issues. You can go ahead and take it away, Chris. Thanks, Janice. Can you see my screen? I can, yes. Okay, so I really appreciate <clears throat> this focus. Um, first of all, I appreciate everybody being here, but I appreciate the focus on um, a wider context to get this California Oak Mortality Task Force annual meeting started. And um, I'm going to continue to try to give a little bit of, of wider context by talking about some of the other things that we've been seeing going on with oaks up and down, uh, particularly the coastal counties, but also to some extent in the um, Sierra Nevada foothills and the Central Valley as well. Um, and you can see from my first slide here that this is a compilation of information from lots of different people who are out there looking or in the lab um, receiving samples and diagnosing them. And um, their contributions and their um, vigilance is much appreciated. Um, people from CAL FIRE, from Phytosphere Research, from um, the Forest Service Region 5, from UC Cooperative Extension, the California Department of Food and Ag, uh, UC Davis and UC Santa Cruz. Um, so thanks everybody. Let's see if I can go forward. Okay, so the first one that I want to mention um, is the one that 
we seem to be seeing up and down the coast most commonly. Uh, one thing I should mention uh, before I get started is some of these I have um, sort of chosen to, to try to emphasize this year because they can be sudden oak death lookalikes, um, particularly when cruising by on the highway at, at that 55 mile an hour speed that Sarah mentioned. Um, but also in many cases, even when you're up a little closer. And so it may be uh, somewhat valuable to look at some of these pictures. And that's kind of what I want to do is just show you some pictures. Um, we found Tabacchia californica um, on tan oak, California black oak, coast live oak, and it is probably on others as well. And it seems to be fairly statewide. And the symptom pattern that I've been seeing on tan oaks in particular, but also to some extent on coast live oaks, involves a bottom up defoliation of the tree. So in those bottom layers of the tree crown, you start to see scattered dead leaves. And there can be lesions on individual leaves, but those lesions can also involve the petioles of the leaves and the twigs, and they can even progress into larger branches. And so on the, in the picture on the left here, you see those scattered, that scattered dead leaf pattern, and it can be fairly uniform within the lower part of that crown. On the right, you can see how that looks when you're zoomed out a little bit more. Um, it can be more or less severe, depending probably on how much inoculum there is in the area there. And then it progresses to what you see on the left in this tan oak, where basically a large part of the bottom of the crown is, is hollowed out. And the parts at the top where there's more sunlight and more airflow potentially seem to be relatively unaffected. That's a pretty common scenario. But there are those trees that also seem to go into a long-term decline. And it's pretty likely that there are other pathogens involved in many of those cases, whether they're root pathogens or they're pathogens of you know, larger branches or the trunk of the tree. And um, we'll talk about one or two of those as well. Here it is on Coast Live Oak, similar pattern attacking the bottom part of the crown first. Um, when this was first identified as a, a sort of a, a, newly, uh, a newly spotted pathogen in California, even though it's probably native um, by um, folks in the Sierra Nevada um, and folks from CDFA, um, they saw it in California black oak. And I don't have any pictures to show today, but on California black oak, one of the prominent symptoms seems to be that hold over leaves from the previous year, they, they aren't detached from the tree. And so you can see those dead leaves still holding on and not blowing off even after the new leaves come out for the year. So that's Tubachia. It seems to be really widespread. Um, we've collected a lot of symptoms throughout um, Del Norte, Humboldt and Mendocino counties this year. And the majority of them have Tabacchia on twigs or leaves, even if they have other pathogens involved as well. But moving on to the next one, Diplodia corticola, which seems also to be very widespread in California. And I don't think that anybody knows for sure whether it is native or not. Um, so is it, it, has it been widespread always or is it becoming more widespread? Not sure, but you can see some typical symptoms of Diplodia here in these pictures from Phytosphere on the left and one that I took up here in Humboldt County on the right. It can cause pretty large stem cankers on tan oaks. Um, I assume it can on other kinds of oaks as well, but the tan oak ones are the ones that I see or think I see fairly commonly. And then on the right, you have um, entire branches that are being killed by the pathogen. So as opposed to that sort of scattered leaf mortality that you see throughout the crown from Tubachia, with Diplodia, you often see these single branches or large sections of trees with um, flags that, are, that consist of many dead um, leaves at a time. You can also see roughened bark 
associated with branch cankers or stem cankers from this pathogen. And it can also create bleeding on the stems or branches of trees as on the right. These are both tan oak here. And these photos are from um, down south along the coast. Um, and they're by Kim Corella. And you can see a twig canker on the left. You can clearly see that margin where dead and living tissue meet. And again, you can see a sunken stem canker. And after the bark is removed, you can see those cankers clearly underneath the bark. And I think that the next slide is more cankers. This one was taken by Phytosphere Research and it, it shows a very long canker along the trunk. And the other thing that shows up with Diplodia corticula are these small black fruiting bodies that can erupt through the bark. Um, of the dead parts of the canker. And you can see those fruiting bodies trailing along that canker. It's a really interesting picture. I think I have two more Diplodia slides because there's just such a variety of symptoms. On the left are some bay laurel leaves that were assayed for both Phytophthora remorum and other fungi. And the round hole punches are um, the ones that were plated on park to check for Phytophthora remorum and the uh, sort of angular ones are the ones that were um, plated on more general growing media. And Phytophthora remorum was infecting these bay leaves, but so was Diplodia corticula from some of those angular pieces that were taken out. And so you can see that the symptoms are not very easily distinguished from those of Phytophthora remorum on bay laurel. And on the, in the picture on the right, the mortality in the stand if you're just going by, it's very hard to distinguish as well. It's, a, it, it's really a true lookalike on many levels. Um, the cankers, maybe we can get to a place at some point where we can say with confidence that the cankers do look different because um, I think that there are some differences. The canker on the left, Diplodia corticula, I, I believe it's not 100% confirmed on this particular tan oak tree yet, but you can see it's very dark. And um, the uncankered xylem tissue seems to be a fairly healthy color. The Phytophthora remorum on the right, the canker looks a little different. It's maybe more translucent. And um, that, that sapwood tissue there is really, even, even the uncankered tissue is really bright pink. Um, so there is a little bit of a different look to these cankers. Um, but once you have the bark off, um, it's relatively easy at that point to test for both pathogens if you need to do that. So that's leaving Diplodia corticula and moving on to other things we've seen. Scale insects seem to be a widespread one this year. We've seen them a lot um, in Shasta, Siskiyou, Trinity, Humboldt counties this year, and they do seem to be associated with whole tree mortality um, in some situations. Uh, canyon live oak, I didn't put on this list, but actually uh, it's, a, it's, it's one that uh, has been associated with scales as well as interior live oak, California black oak, tan oak, and more than once I have found it, uh, these scale insects associated with Diplodia corticula. So I don't know which comes first, if they're both responding to stress. Um, Diplodia is one of those pathogens that is known to be fueled by drought stress on the plants that it is infecting. And it is very likely that scale insects are also responding to this kind of water stress um, that drought is causing as well. Here are just some close-ups of those scales. One kind, you know, on the left called oak pit scale um, and the ones on the right on a California black oak are more like the lacanium scales, the big bumpy ones. Um, both of these we've seen on branches or twigs that also have cankers from pathogens. So the association between that um, would be interesting to explore further. Um, we also have been seeing a lot of foamy bark canker this year on interior live oak, coast live oak, California black oak. Um, the reports that I've been getting are primarily from Mendocino, Sonoma area, also some from the South Bay. And I'm sure that the people at UC Davis 
have been getting reports from many other places this year as well. Um, here are some close-ups of the symptoms before you take the bark away on the right and after you take it away on the left. And you can just see um, all of these different uh, insect attacks associated with these pathogens that are brought into the trees. Here are some more um, samples from uh, shared with me by CDFA showing um, insect um, entrance holes and galleries along with the associated um, fungus that it brings in with it, a geosmithia species. And you can also see the fruiting bodies in close up on the right in those galleries. Um, so foamy bark canker is, uh, is one that seems to be on the rise this year. And like the others, probably um, associated with drought stress primarily. Um, also, Phytophthora remorum isn't the only Phytophthora that we see out there attacking oak and tan oak trees. Phytophthora cinnamomi is also uh, observed fairly commonly, and symptoms from it uh, in association with other organisms are probably on the rise um, this year as well. Um, this is one from Santa Barbara that you can see a bleeding canker at the base of the tree. You know, it, it's the same sort of symptom that we would see from Phytophthora remorum. It wouldn't really be possible to distinguish this one from Phytophthora remorum just based on the tree and the canker itself, looking at it from the outside. We'd need some, some lab work there. And here's one from Sonoma County with the uh, bark on on the left and then the bark taken off on the right. And once again, you can see those cankers under the bark with that um, black margin and the inside of the canker looking kind of translucent, in some ways reminiscent of that Phytophthora or Morum canker that I showed on tan oak earlier. So moving to insect pests, although foamy bark canker is associated with uh, western oak bark beetle, so it involves an insect pest as well. Um, this one, the Mediterranean oak borer, is one that was has really only been on our radar screen for a couple of years, and um, this shows some some delimitation trapping results from 2020. Um, this was first noted as a problem, and it it, it has mainly been uh, found to be a problem for valley oaks um, in in first in Napa County and then seen to spread to Lake County and Sonoma County. Um, it also is um, a problem. It's infesting blue oaks and it has been found on a California black oak branch, but just that one branch, um, it's unclear to what extent it could be a problem for California black oak. It's definitely a problem for valley oaks. It seems to be killing um, even very large old mature valley oaks. Um, <clears throat> and it could very well be in additional areas that have not been surveyed yet. And since it seems to be affiliated with the white oak group of oaks, um, we are on the watch, especially in particular areas of Sonoma County where uh, Oregon white oak comes down and coincides with the range of these other oaks. And we haven't found it on Oregon white oak yet, but we're watching that. And here are some of the symptoms of Mediterranean oak borer. These black stained galleries that spread out in one plane through the stem and intersect each other. Um, these weaken large old branches. And um, so one of the easiest ways to find out whether the tree's infested is to look for those large branch pieces on the ground. Um, here's a look at what it looks like in the tree as a whole. Um, these beetles usually don't go into the heartwood except in smaller branches. And um, you'll see that it seems like the symptoms manifest in the upper part of the crown first which makes it very difficult to detect this thing in the early stages of attack. Um, in an advanced infestation, you'll also see boring dust on the lower parts of the bowl. And there can be some staining of the inner tissue in valley oaks. That doesn't seem to be the case so much in blue oak, 
but we have a limited number of samples to judge from at this point in Blue Oak. And so you can see what those galleries look like. And then the last thing that I want to touch on that we've been seeing in a, a fairly widespread manner this year um, is California oakworm. And um, Kim Carella has been seeing it down in uh, Santa Barbara County uh, infesting some large acreages. We've seen it up in the north um, in a more scattered fashion, um, not necessarily associated with really large scale defoliation. But the oakworm is definitely known, especially in that central coast area, to be capable of defoliating big swaths of, of trees. And um, I believe that some of that may have been seen by aerial detection survey this year. Not so sure about that for 100%. Um, but it can be visible from the air when it is uh, when one of these outbreaks has really gotten going. So we'll see how these develop. And we'll also see how they affect these oak trees um, especially when combined with these drought conditions. I believe that that is all I have. Yes, and I just wanted to kind of give you a quick walkthrough of some of those pictures so that people can be on the lookout for some of these sudden oak death lookalikes um, and, um, and just, be, just, be, just be aware that, that what people are seeing out there is not always a note deaf. Thank you, Chris. That was great. We have time if we want to for a specific question for Chris. There was a little bit of comments that Mateo had put in about some of the things that you were talking about, Chris. I don't know if there's um, not a question in there, but just to see what Mateo has written. Yeah. And I then really if there's any other questions, we can take those. I do appreciate those comments. Those are totally, those seem totally on target to me. And especially the one about diplodias being driven by drought. Um, they always seem to be linked to drought, whether they're in oaks or pines. Um, and the healthy tan oak phloem is pink. It definitely is. But I at least think that I see it turning really bright red in many cases when it's infected with some sort of um, Phytophthora sort of uh, pathogen or maybe our malaria as well. Um, and so I saw a difference between the phloem in, in the tree infected by diplodia and the one infected by remorum. And maybe it's my imagination, but um, that's what I thought I saw. Um, management strategies for Tubakia. The problem that I see with management strategies for Tubakia is that it is extremely widespread and it seems to be infecting large swaths of both the crowns of individual trees and large numbers of trees in a given area. So it's very difficult um, for me to know um, how you would effectively treat that, particularly since it's a native and widespread pathogen, and maybe since its damage is linked to drought too. And I'll turn it over to Mateo for the next question. Yeah, I think we'll go ahead and move into the more general Q&A. So catching back up with the question, um, the comment from Mateo during Sarah's talk about not using the term variant, I'm going to go ahead and ask Mateo, if you want to unmute, you can just go ahead and explain a little bit more about that. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, and then may add a comment about diplodias and, and management a little bit. Uh, so the, um, and Tubacius. So the, 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 the term variant, usually we, we normally use it in epidemiology to identify an individual that's, that's closely related to another one. But for some reason, for, there was, there's been one or, or few mutations that have changed its phenotype. So basically think of two, think of almost of like two, quasi identical twins or two identical twins, but for some reason one had one mutation and, and it can run a lot faster. So a variant is normally used for something that in time, it's not very deep in time. When we talk about Phytophthora lineages, we're talking about 
um, genotypes that diverged in, in deep time. And there was a paper by Nick Grunewald that I think estimated the divergence time between 100,000 and 300,000 years. So a variant, if, if it remains isolated, will become a lineage, but a lineage is not a variant because it originated a much longer time ago than a variant. So it has accumulated a lot more mutations than, than a variant. Does that make sense? I'm gonna assume that it makes sense and people can okay. follow up with other questions if they don't understand. Susan says yes. Um, Mateo, you also wanted to, to comment back on some of the things that yeah. Chris had ended with. Yeah, I, th I think that the common thread here, so almost every single disease that um, Chris nicely presented and the diseases that we identified both in acacias and eucalyptus, they're all fungi that have some report, even the ones that we don't know very, very much of being driven by climate change or being driven at least by unfavorable, unfavorable conditions for the plant host. So I think that that's, that's very important. Now with this foliar blight, there is an interesting combination that seems counterintuitive. So in order to have these um, foliar blights um, to express themselves, you actually need some kind of physiological stress on the plant host, which normally is given by too little water to simplify things. But then we need high levels of moisture in the air. So, and, and the, the two don't need, they, they don't have to be synchronous. So the, the water shortage has to come before. So you could have water shortage that starts, uh, you know, the, the stress in the plant. And then you need some moisture for these, for these foliar blight that are originally endophytic organisms to develop. So normally that is, that's why you see the, the disease develop from the lower part of the canopy because it's the one that is, is, mo is, is moisture. And then as the inoculum builds up, it will, you know, it will basically overflow on the entire canopy, even on areas that are drier. So anything that you can do to reduce the, 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 the coexistence of these two conditions will slow down the, these types of diseases in general. So limit the number of spores limit the relative humidity on the canopy and give enough water to the plant if possible. I mean, and you're not gonna go water the forest, but you know, theoretically speaking. And Yana has a follow-up question that maybe combines both what Matteo you've just said and something if Chris wants to chime in about how climate becomes more or less favorable for some of these different issues. Yeah, so um, Yana um, was wondering if it might be possible that Tubakia could retreat if the, if the climate becomes less favorable, um, or will it just persist in these locations waiting for the right conditions again? I mean, based on everything that I've heard, including the things that, that Mateo has been telling us, I am assuming that these pathogens tend to persist waiting for the right conditions, especially since they many of them seem to be native and widespread and very well established. Um, and I'd be curious to know if Matteo agrees with that. Yes, so do you remember when I showed you the slide with the three curves? So if you remember, the yellow curve was the one in the middle and it goes up and down, but it keeps going higher up. So if anything, these pathogens that are, the, the tobacco has a very known, uh, as a, is well known to be an endophyte. So these pathogens are likely to increase their presence because every time there is a cycle, there's gonna be more spores in the air. More spores in the air means more infection. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that's difficult to measure because that endophytic infection will not show itself sometimes for decades until the physiological conditions deteriorate. So we don't know the amplitude of the cycle, but it's, it's very improb improbable that uh, a, a momentary return to favorable conditions for the plant, we reduced, really reduce the disease. The organism is gonna go up in, in time um, and then will express itself every time the conditions become 
unfavorable to the host. Mateo, can you talk a little bit about whether you were able to isolate any of those endophytes from healthy trees? This was a question that Simon had asked early on. Yeah, th that's a good question. And probably if I, I, if I hadn't been told by the funding agencies, we, we, we want results within like a month, <laughs> which everybody knows you don't even have time to go out and get the, get the samples. So we were requested to provide results really fast. So one bias of our research was to sample disease tissue, but uh, there is ample literature. All of, all of the taxa that we found and that I refer to as latent pathogens um, are all known to be present in healthy plants. So I'm using the literature as a support of the fact that these exist in healthy plants. And the, and the literature is very is very ample. I mean, there's lots of papers on, on almost every single one of those organisms that I cited. Susan asked a question in the chat to Matteo, Chris, and also Ted Swicky um, about whether or not P. remorum is causing less or more damage in California given the current drought. And Ted has responded with his uh, thoughts about drought stress. I'm wondering if Chris or Mateo want to add anything to that. Well, I do think that we'll, um, for those of you who are able to tune in tomorrow, that um, we're going to get an update on um, Mateo's sod blitz results. Is that correct, Mateo? That might help answer that question a little bit. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, we'll we'll share what we, we have so far. It's a little early for us, but we, we have some preliminary results. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I personally, um, suspect that we are seeing somewhat less damage um, in terms of mortality, or I guess really more in terms of new infections um, this year. In terms of mortality, we still may be seeing some, some mortality that's connected to sudden oak death simply because those trees were infected back in the um, time when we had a wetter winter, um, the one that Mateo referred to, and they're just now um, the drought stress is maybe hastening some of that mortality. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's hard to know given that lag period, but I'm guessing that there are less infections um, this year. Yeah, and, and I agree. And I also agree with Ted. I mean, in my longer presentation, I make it very clear that I talk about physiological stress and it, it it doesn't necessarily equate to drought stress. So there's other reasons why plants go into stress. So we should be careful. So the definition of these latent pathogens, in fact, you can, you can cause stress by mechanically wounding the plant. <laughs> so it's, a, and, and, and uh, Ted mentions um, uh, the understory, if, if it's a in the suppressed understory, you see some of these pathogens. So any condition that's particularly stressful will cause will physiologically for the plant will cause the expression of these latent pathogens. Now, the only two that we see all the time, and one of them refers to maybe is similar to what Ted is mentioning is um, climate change. So meaning not just drought, but it's, it's warmer days, less fog and less water, okay? Uh, or, or, or water less consistently delivered to the ecosystem. So that's one. And number two is too many trees. Too many trees is the other, you know, and the two things may be uh, interconnected, but it's also true that when we have too many trees, we see, it's more likely to see the expression of these outbreaks as well. I'm gonna circle back to Sarah since we haven't heard from her for a little bit. And Sarah, Susan had asked a question, if there's any interest by regulatory agencies to regulate by lineage. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there are some APHIS folks here on the call. I see Betsy and um, William Wesla on, um, if they want to chime in on that. But in, in terms of Oregon for our state quarantine and Chris Benneman with ODA is here as well. I mean, the conversations with ODF, ODA, Forest Service here in Oregon, we haven't um, discussed putting any information into uh, regulatory language in terms of lineage. Um, and 
but we do work together to set the priority for, we've set the priority in the past for the E1 lineage after the detection in 2015. And together we have set the priority of um, treating and using funding for the NA2 lineage here in Oregon. Great, and this, I don't know if this relates so much to regulations, but there is this question about whether or not there's any way to anticipate what future pathogens might enter ecosystems due to changing climate. Um, I think from a research perspective, and then maybe also if there's any way to anticipate that for regulations would be a great discussion topic. Can I take a little crack at that? Um, it, um, it, it's important, I think, to separate uh, sort of non-native invasive problems from those that might be already here and widespread. We have a good idea of what some of those non-native invasive things are that, that could enter um, and cause problems regardless of the climatic situation. For example, emerald ash borer or gypsy moth. I think it's more difficult to anticipate which native widespread pathogens, especially the latent ones that Matteo talked about, it's a lot harder to anticipate which ones of those might cause problems. Um, for example, uh, Matteo mentioned bisconioxia. That's another one that I didn't mention that we have isolated from oaks um, as well. And um, even from in the past, uh, Douglas fir branches that were chlorotic, but uh, not particularly terribly symptomatic. Uh, <clears throat> who knows how much of that is around in trees, probably a lot, but can you anticipate when it's going to pop up and cause a big problem? We probably won't know until it actually starts to do that. That's my two cents. Yes, and I would actually turn the you know, turn, to, turn it upside down. And so there are several statistical models that allow you to predict which pathogen, you know, where a pathogen will do best, where it will do okay, and where it won't do so well. And that's based on host presence and how infectious the hosts are, which, which we, we refer to as a host competency. Uh, and then on climatic conditions, including soil types, so ecological and climatic conditions. So there's several models that can actually tell you that. The problem, so, th so these are the two problems that I see. And then I'll, I'll give you an example. So one problem is actually that we don't know. <laughs> I, I, I have kind of, I take a different, even if Chris and I are probably saying the same thing, I'll take a different angle, say we don't really know where humans are going to introduce pathogens. And so the, the, the human component is kind of relatively unpredictable. And, and because there is no steady variable or a variable that makes any sense biologically that we can input in these models. So except for maybe urban areas or agriculture, you know, of a certain type. So we can input those, but those are highly variable. They can change because crops can change. So they're not, they're not very stable and they haven't been used successfully. But we could actually predict which pathogens that are present somewhere else could do really well. Um, the other problem is that it's hard for us to predict the future in terms of ecology. So, so we can use current data. So we can use current climatic and ecological data. And we can say, well, as of now, uh, these are our predictions. But as Chris was saying, um, the emergence of these latent pathogens is probably an immediate result of rapid, a relatively rapid climate change. And that was not predictable. I mean, if, if five years ago we tried to model this, we would have never have guessed that all of these pathogens would have become so significant in Northern California. So that is kind of the, the complication. So putting the two, the two together is a little difficult. You know, one, one case where, where we could have success, for instance, Phytophthora cinnamoma, that was mentioned. So we, we have some understanding of where it is, both in agriculture and, and, in, um, and in nature. And we do know that some climatic conditions will will increase disease severity uh, because sometimes like th these oaks can actually live with the tarsus in a moment for a long time. 
But if conditions become harsher for the oaks, then cinnamoma becomes a major driver. So, so I think in that case, maybe it's actually, it would be possible to combine the two. But as you see, it's a very complicated um, exercise. It's not something that's easily done. And there is a, a very high uncertainty in whatever you predict. Thank but you one, both that, for that. Yeah, one more, and if, if you wanna check it out, what one model that's used a lot, it's eco, ecological niche modeling. So that's kind of, if you, if you type that in, it's, it's a very common used approach to, to define where we should find a pathogen based on the known distribution in, in the rest of the world. We have about five minutes left. I'm going to do this one last question that I see hanging out there before we close out. So during Mateo's talk, Dan had asked about fog and whether there's any theories about how a marine layer could enhance the spread of diseases within a dense stand of trees. I would like to, to hear what Chris thinks. So I can talk from experience based on pine peach canker. So for pine peach canker, we found, um, and we were surprised, we found that uh, the, the most sporulation by pine peach canker was during the rainy season and then during August on the coast. And those years where we were working, there was a lot of fog in August. So my answer would be that, um, yes, I suspect, um, I suspect that fog may, may actually uh, favor some of these latent pathogens. What do, what do you think, Chris? Yeah, I, I'm 100% with you there. And I think that's a really good example of the pitch canker being a non-native and then some of the native pathogens also displaying that same um, tendency. A Western gall rust, for example, in coastal pines, it seems like um, uh, it is able, it, it feels to me just by observing it sporulating, um, like you can see it sporulating along the coast in May, you can see it sporulating in September. And rather than sporulating the whole season long, it's probably responding in some way to those optimal moist periods when there's a lot of fog and the temperatures are right. Um, and so, uh, yes, I think that, um, that these pathogens can be really responsive to that and that the fog makes a, a, a big difference. Um, conversely, in some places along the coast, um, some, of the anecdotes I've heard from landowners are that they've seen over the years, this year may be different, but before this year, you know, for many years in a row, they felt like they had seen a lot less fog and um, they felt like that was a stress factor on at least on some of the coastal pine species. Um, and that's anecdotal and it's hard to kind of know uh, how accurate that is. Um, but I think it seems like fog is, a really important factor. One late breaking question I think we might be able to squeeze in, which is uh, whether or not spores can move on wildfire smoke. Well, the answer I think is yes. So it's, a, it's an interesting story. So there's a paper that just came out about human pathogens that spread on fire smoke. I think it was human pathogens. Um, I can find that paper. Uh, and um, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a complex story because movement may be favored by smoke, but then there are old papers that show that smoke inhibits, uh, old papers done at Berkeley by Parmeter, they actually, um, shows that smoke inhibits sporulation, I mean, germination, sorry, of spores. So, and, and then also we, we, we need to, to, to think about, you know, the number of viable spores. So is that enough to reach the threshold that's necessary? So I don't know whether effectively they actually can cause disease in a different area, but the, the, the simple answer to that question is yes. I think they can carry spores. Um, yeah, I think whether, yeah. I think there were older, uh, at least one older paper where they also, they sampled some spores from, from sp smoke, but surely it depends on the specific pathogen and the specific kinds of spores that it makes, right? 
yeah, there may be some issue with uh, the type of spore. So it's not universal, but can he, can he carry some spores? Yes. Now, will those spores germinate? I think it's a more complicated question. Yes, I agree with Mateo there. There has been some research, I think it's out of University of Idaho, um, and they've, been, they've looked at prescribed burning and fungal spores um, coming out of those prescribed burns and forests in Florida. Um, and we have gotten the question here in Oregon, and it's something that you know, we've thought about trying to put together a small study with Oregon State University um, on. Well, with that, I am going to uh, end the meeting also because my two teenagers just came home from school and it's very loud in my house now. So I want to thank you again, uh, Sarah, Mateo, and Chris for your presentations and also to all the participants who are here with us virtually. If we didn't get your question live today, I, I think we got to most of them, but if we didn't, we will follow up with you again via email soon. If you're joining us at tomorrow's executive committee update meeting, you should be able to use the same Zoom link that you used today. We'll be starting that at 1 p.m. Pacific. Again, that's tomorrow, Wednesday, the 22nd. Until then, I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much.